G20 is set to generate consensus and drive collective action on key enablers of life to make it a global movement, life to provide impetus to global efforts towards growth and development while pursuing strong climate ambitions. Thursday saw G20 delegates being acquainted with India's knowledge centers. The delegations visited IISC Bangalore, ranked among the world's, world's top institutions for scientific research. On display was the work of Indian startups in new and emerging technologies, including artificial intelligence, robotics, and nanotechnology. Have a look. After the successful completion of the first meeting of the finance track under India's G20 presidency, G20 delegates got a chance to catch a glimpse of the startup ecosystem incubated at IISC Bangalore. Uh, Secretary, uh, Department of Economic uh, Affairs Ajay Seth and Chief Economic Advisor V. Anant Nageshwaran were also seen taking keen interest in the semiconductor and nanotechnology startup ecosystem on the occasion. We were essentially giving them a glimpse of what the institute is all about in um, you know, advanced science and education in the country. We have created many institutes in the country and we hope that we have conveyed you know, what IASC stands for. And uh, we also took this occasion to sort of show them um, the finest labs that we have in the institute, that is nanotechnology center in the institute, and also showcase the Bangalore startup ecosystem which arguably perhaps the best ecosystem for startups in the world. Financial arm of G20 visited us today so that they could get a glimpse about startups in the area of deep tech including HAL, biotech, medtech, artificial intelligence, robotics, semiconductors which India is embarking on in a big way and they got to see areas in which India is coming up, how they could possibly potentially finance as it could help their countries back there and how it could possibly also result in products that could be helpful to them in the long run. The G20 delegation members were impressed with the show and are of the view that some of the solutions can be replicated in their respective countries. Absolutely, I was uh, taking a look at the unmanned um, aircrafts to deliver packages uh, in, in difficult regions and I think in places like Mexico where geography is a bit complicated that could have a really uh, large impact. Uh, I see that as a very useful uh, technology. Startups showcased at IASC range from space and geospatial technology to aircraft manufacturing and robotics. Many express the hope that the visit of G20 delegates will help them go international. We are showcasing mobile robot telepresence that is a unique technological vehicle which allows you to have live walking experience of another location. Not only that, it also allows you to move your neck around, it allows you to see what is going on so that you can participate, have real immersive participatory experience of that other place. It's huge, it is going to surpass 600 billion in the next five years. Kati Robotics has a mandate to make robotic components. These are the core building blocks that go into making robots. So think of it as if you have a Lego block, you can make an entire building. Now, m most people right now, they integrate these blocks and make their robotic systems. If the G20 is to help accelerate progress towards SDGs, focus must be on rejuvenating legacy data sets and using artificial intelligence and big data analytics including drones and geospatial mapping to generate futuristic new data sets. And India has much to offer the world on both these fronts. Ajay Mishra's report from Bengaluru for DD India. In an exclusive conversation with DD India's correspondent Ajay Mishra, founder member of Infosys TV Mohandas Pai hailed India as a global leader in the digital space and projected it to be the fastest growing digital economy in the near future. For startups, he proposed a $10 billion fund of funds in G20, calling for G20 to work towards ensuring adequate capital, which he said is lacking currently. Listen in. We have very special guest here in Bangalore, Mr. T. V. Mohandas Pai, who is a Padma Awardee and a renowned, uh, uh, you know, professional in in the field of HR and the field of 
uh, IT and whatnot. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, you know speaking to us. Uh, first of all, uh, we have just concluded uh, the Sherpa track, first Sherpa track, and the finance track meeting where the data and technology, the technological transformation, is one of the core agendas of G20 presidency. How do you look at the agenda which has been set by the India to start with? In the last 15 years, the digital revolution has started, and India is a global leader. And in the digital area, what India has done today, no country in human history has been able to do. And it has been driven by technology and data under the leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. On August 15, 2015, our Prime Minister stood up in Red Fort and said, Digital India, Stand Up India, Start Up India. I don't think many people understood what he meant. But today, look at what has happened. We have the India stack, Aadhaar, 1.3 billion people. UPI, 7.3 billion transactions, $150 billion of money being transferred every single month. Yes. And then we have the ONDC, yeah. and then we have the EKYC, we have the personal data locker, and then we have the account aggregator, mm -hmm. and then we have other things like threats for financial inclusion. Yes. And using this technology, 475 million bank accounts have been opened. But sir, that's what uh, is the real problem is. The data is being governed, be, being controlled by the big tech in the, in, in, in the USA, where the Google and the, and the Meta and, and the companies are in the, actually are having a hold on the data. The world decides yeah. whom does the data belong to. Yes. One, the data should belong to you and me because of personal data. Absolutely. Second, if somebody wants to use it, it has to be used by your permission. Yes. We need the data architecture yeah. called for permission and it's called the data consent architecture. India has done that. Yeah. And the third, the data has to reside in your country so that in case of misuse, your government protects you. Yeah. Now, I have so many malcontents in Delhi who say that, oh, data can be anywhere else. In the United States, if my data resides there, I'm a non-resident alien. I'm not a citizen. They're not going to protect me. Yes. The data will be available to the NSA. Yes. Today, the U.S. has the largest cloud architecture in the world, the largest quantum of data of all the people in the yes. world. And the national security of the United States has free access to it. So they're not going to protect us. So it has to be here and our government is protect us and they say it will be misused. It cannot be misused because we have the courts. The yeah. courts will protect us. So this is a canard that's being spent. Mm -hmm. So we must have it here and you must do it. Now we'll talk about the uh, startup ecosystem because you have preempted my question, sir. We are uh, third largest ecosystem in terms of startups. We, we started with 160 startups. Now we are uh, 84,000 plus. Every week we are, uh, you know, uh, creating a unicorn. Where do you see this startup ecosystem going forward? Because a delegation is right now in, uh, you know, in Bangalore to actually feel it on the ground. Well, we'll have about 200,000 startups by 2025 December. We probably will have 250 unicorns. We'll create maybe $1.5 trillion of value and that's going to grow. We'll have about 35 lakh employees by then. We already have about maybe 18 lakh employees in the startup ecosystem. And I think it's going to explode. But what it has done, is to transform the views of a young people. Yes. We're creating a new generation of young entrepreneurs who are growing up in the digital world and interacting with young people in the metaverse. You see, today, you and I possibly are people of the analog world yes. going into digital. Yes. The next generation is the digital, digital, digital generation. The yes. generation yes. after them who are 13 to 15 today are the metaverse generation. And the metaverse is coming with artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and with uh, you know machine learning coming, and with the genomics coming, and uh, robotics, humanoids coming, and all space technologies, and unmanned vehicles. We're going to see an upsurge of innovation, and India is poised there. Mr. Pai, it was wonderful talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. I, I think it's, it's a time of uh, time for India, as you as you have said, and 2047, our aim, our mission for being a developed nation is not too far. That's all in this exclusive conversation. Thanks for watching. Namaskar. Did India correspondent Ajay Mishra also spoke with heads of foreign delegations participating in finance track meetings in Bengaluru on expectations from India's G20 presidency and their impressions of India's vibrant cultural diversity. Let's listen in to talking heads from France and UAE. Uh, the experience so far is, uh, is, is very good. Uh, we had a very productive two-day meeting uh, we the warmth of the welcome uh, here in uh, Bengaluru uh, was absolutely great uh, we enjoyed uh, 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 you know very uh, I think intensive work sessions but we also attended cultural events 
uh, and so uh, we see that there is a full mobilization of uh, uh, all the authorities in India uh, uh, to make uh, this G20 a success. India is strategically a really an important player in the G20, both by its size, it's a democracy, it has an enormous amount of uh, intellectual and policy talent, and in that sense I think that uh, you know, we're very excited about uh, India's chairing of the G20 and its, uh, and its leadership. We come because uh, the G20 is an important institution, uh, it's where important decisions are made, uh, for mo some of the most important players in the world. I think what, what would attract me here is both the combination of the fact that uh, India will set the bar high on the quality of discussion and conversations uh, and the fantastic country and the diversity of the country and the warm reception we get from everyone, feeling at home instantly. And I think that's, you know, you arrive here and you feel you're at home instantly. So the delegates say they are feeling at home about what do Indian startups uh, and uh, incubators feel about the visits of these uh, delegates uh, to IISC, the Indian Institute of Science in Bengaluru. Let's uh, get a perspective on that uh, from Umakan Soni. He is a CEO Art Park. It is an artificial intelligence and robotics uh, technology park. It is an incubator supported by the Indian Institute of Science. Such a pleasure to have uh, you, uh, Mr. Sony, on uh, this uh, special broadcast, India G20. You got to interact with some of the G20 delegates. How were those uh, interactions like? And were they keen on replicating some of the solutions exhibited by, say, your incubator on AI and robotics, particularly in their countries? Uh, fantastic, great to be here. Uh, one of the key, uh, myself, Umar Kansoni, and I'm the CEO uh, of Art Park. Art Park stands for AI and Robotics Technology Park. And uh, we showcase some of the, the startups that are actually working in the cutting on the cutting edge of AI and robotics. And uh, it's a huge revolution. We have, we've got to create $15.7 trillion of new economic value in the next 10 to 15 years. And 90% uh, of that value is going to be in the digital physical beam. Uh, the dawn of hybrid in that sense and it was fantastic to actually interact with the G20 delegates because they are looking at uh, the usage of this and you know when we look at the, the broad spectrum of usage and, uh, and and I'm not just talking about the developed world but I'm also talking about the developing world and it was very inter interesting to hear how you know we've been actually creating this uh, cargo drones which can take 250 to 300 kg of payload and it can go up to you know, 500 uh, you know kilometers range, and how that might transform, let's say, the economy in uh, you know Mexico or in uh, Argentina or maybe in a neighboring nation like Nepal. So it was great to get that feedback that you know this is a worthwhile problem to solve because they also see a, a similar sort of challenge, and it's very important and critical because uh, today, uh, you know, these hundred plus unicorns that we have in India. Uh, they're not just creating these unicorns, uh, the companies, but they're also training this innovation talent, right? So India is actually having the maximum amount of innovation talent, which is born digital. And it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful uh, perspective to have in India. Mm -hmm. And if we couple that with the technology resources, 11% of all AI talent you know, comes out of India. So if we couple it with that, we, we could create leapfrog companies, which will not just work in India, but could also go to Southeast Asia, Middle East, Africa, even in U.S. and Europe, and and we are already seeing that uh, you know some of that uh, you know perspective. We had one of the company that we had supported uh, earlier called Vaisa, which was applying uh, you know uh, AI to uh, mental health through chatbots, and they're getting not just used in India but also in uh, U.S. and U.K. now. Mm -hmm. So so we see this whole progression where startups which are creating these disruptive new technology. Uh, and and create finding out the use case, they will not just remain in India, but will go global. And because India is a great representation of the kind of problems, it, uh, you know, we might get. I call it India. We have the supermarket of problems, right? All present in front of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and for AI, that the, the problem data is key because if you have the problem data, then you can create solutions. So India would become a sort of like the storehouse of solutions. Uh, right. you know, leveraging AI and robotics, not just for itself, but also for the, uh, you know, uh, global world. And this right. G20 delegates uh, provided a great feedback on that. 
Uh, Mr. Sony, your thoughts on what's really driving the exponential growth? We are looking at a 15,000 percentage rise over six years in the number of uh, Indian startups. So, particularly in the tech space, uh, what is uh, driving uh, that sort of growth and what are the constraints that still remain? Because you would have heard Mohan Das Pai talk about how G20 should set up a fund of funds for startup of around $10 billion because there are capital constraints, he said. No, absolutely. I think uh, one of the great initiatives uh, that you know current uh, you know uh, government has taken up is this creation of fund of funds. So there were two fund of funds that were created: startup fund of fund and uh, electronic development fund. And uh, you know I had set up a, a previously a venture fund called Five Ventures, and we got support under that. And not only us, there were like hundred plus venture funds which got supported under that. And these venture funds in turn supported startups, right? So you see the, the whole decentralization of funding infrastructure actually has created these assets today which are becoming unicorns. So I think this decentralization of funding infrastructure was a key, key, uh, you know, uh, and I would say a very decisive step in the direction of, uh, you know, making India the, you know, startup nation in that sense. And I think if we, you know, uh, learn from that successful experiment and amplify it. And that's where probably, you know, he was talking about $10 billion, you know, fund of fund experiment, uh, which G20 can put together, it could be public, private in, more, uh, in, in the same way, which in turn could fund venture funds and venture fund could fund, you know, startups. And these could be about global problems, right? Mm -hmm. Like today we have a challenge in terms of how do we bring, you know, uh, connect the unconnected, right? And, and right. Uh, we saw interacting with G20, uh, uh, you know, uh, representatives that whether it is Nepal, whether it is Mexico, whether it is Argentina, the fruits of technology have to reach uh, the last mile. And for that, there is a massive challenge. Hmm. We have a problem uh, in terms of sustainability and climate change, which everybody has to come together and solve it. So if right. we can actually have this fund of fund, uh, which basically talks about, you know, applying technologies to solve the SDG goals, hmm. uh, this could be a massive game changer. Hmm. Very quickly. How and uh, by when do you see India becoming uh, the startup destination for the world when it comes to artificial intelligence and robotics uh, through G20 and other ways? No, I think uh, uh, and this is where I see India has a huge role to play. Uh, I think if the capital comes in, uh, startup ecosystem uh, it comes together. We have training so many of uh, the innovation talent. And that's where the accelerators uh, and incubators like Art Park are playing a critical role because we have this massive university ecosystem which is training talent at large scale and creating research. Now, if you build this research translation infrastructure and connect it to the problems that uh, you know the, the uh, we are all facing across G20, India could be source of a lot of this innovation and what today people saw was just a glimmer of what is actually possible. I mean, we could amplify it by you know thousand times if mm. we can get enough uh, you know talent, research, data, and uh, capital along uh, you know with this problem set. Thank you, Mr. Sony, for uh, charting in a sense a roadmap to India becoming the startup destination in the world, particularly in AI and robotics, a field that you are associated with. India already is the third the largest uh, startup ecosystem in the world. Thank you for joining us with your views. Well, let's move on now to substantive Mr. pleasure. The substantive meetings of the first development working group concluded in Mumbai on day two. Here's DD India correspondent Amrit Pal Singh with the day's roundup from Mumbai. As the two-day deliberations of the development working group under India's presidency of G20 concluded here in Mumbai, the consensus that emerged among the member countries, the invitee countries and the participating international organizations was that collective and decisive action has to be taken by all stakeholders if any meaningful progress has to be made on achieving the sustainable development goals. In a globalized world where everything is changing, data uh, offer potential for changing the way of uh, approaching development challenges and that's why data for development, data for SDG, for sustainable development goals is so important and the India presidency rightly so is putting that at the 
top of their priorities and uh, GE20 I think is a perfect uh, opportunity to discuss these issues with more depth and looking at what we can do. The delegates committed to putting the collective weight of these countries behind life or the lifestyle for environment movement, women-led development and effective use of data for development, especially bridging the global digital divide. Information uh, usually it's, uh, it could be delivered in different forms, uh, in digital as well as on paper. So um, it's important not just to have data, but it should be objective and there should be some standards for this. And I believe that in our country we, uh, we could solve this problem and we are ready to share our experience with other countries as well. The idea is to ensure that no one is left behind as these countries commit to give a renewed push to sustainable development. With cameraman YK Loknath, this is Amrit Pal Singh for DD India in Mumbai. And our correspondent Amrit Pal Singh now joins us from Mumbai. Amrit, uh, particularly I thought that uh, data for development and life, or lifestyle for environment were two key focus areas today. What does the G20 initiative on data for development propose to do and how? Uh, look, uh, you know, over the two days of deliberation, Mun Mun, uh, basically uh, they uh, focused on sustainable development goals and uh, because uh, the record of uh, countries on working towards sustainable, achieving sustainable development goals has been a missile, uh, a missile, a missile, okay, uh, a has been bad. Yes. So, uh, you know, uh, so there was, a yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, they, uh, uh, it was you know the, uh, decided that the, a renewed push needs to be given for that. The new tools that have emerged of uh, data, using data, uh, uh, bridging the da uh, global uh, uh, digital divide, uh, creating uh, d digital infrastructure, uh, especially in the developing world. That uh, was uh, the key uh, focus of the deliberations when it came to data for development. Because data, mm, uh, you know, uh, uh, best practices were put forward by India that how it used data to reach out uh, to its people. Today, you know, the Jandhan accounts, 56% of them uh, women hold. Uh, key policies are being, uh, you know, shaped by data. So uh, the, the focus was to use the uh, tool of data to uh, further give impetus to achieving uh, the sustainable development goals uh, given the agenda 2030. So uh, that was the key focus when it came to data that how development which uh, has to be inclusive, which has to you know, take everybody along, that nobody is left out, um, how different tools can be the modern tools and the emerging tools can be used to achieve that. Mun -mun. Amrit, how is India driving consensus on life, a lifestyle for environment and what uh, scale and size uh, would India like uh, this mission to take through G20 and beyond? What India wishes to do is that uh, use uh, lifestyle for environment movement to uh, sort of merge uh, the achievement of SDG by public pa uh, uh, participation. Now, uh, life basically says that you that the citizen bec takes active part. It's not just left to governments or you know uh, institutions uh, to bring about uh, to arrest climate change, uh, but by taking small steps at the individual level, reduce the collective carbon footprint. We are six million of us, six billion of us in the world. So if uh, you know eighty uh, two thirds of that population lives in these G20 countries. Uh, add to that the invitee countries uh, who are part of it, nine more countries, and you can really start a global movement. Uh, the Prime Minister had proposed this idea first at Glasgow COP uh, uh, conference where he had appealed to the globe to do it. So even if G20 is able to put its collective weight behind uh, the life movement, you can achieve uh, um, you know, uh, 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 big goals. So I think at this G20, India is trying to use uh, life to uh, convince the G20 countries that this is an idea whose time has come and uh, these countries need to collectively work towards uh, you know merging using uh, life 
uh, to uh, attain the goals of SDG and arrest uh, climate change, which is, of course, the biggest uh, problem of our times. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Amrit, for joining us with your inputs. And it's a time to say goodbye, but before that, uh, we'll leave you with the visuals of G20 delegates uh, who explored India's rich and colorful art and crafts. The exhibition outside uh, the meeting venue displayed traditional Indian weaves, handicrafts, paintings, sweets, and ornaments from Maharashtra. This is going to be a treat to your eyes. Thanks for watching. अगर बैंक आपकी कम्प्लेन को एक महीने में नहीं सुल जाता तो आप आर बी आई के कम्प्लेन मैनेजमेंट सिस्टम आरोप ऑनलाइन कम्प्लेन कर सकते हैं ये आर बी आई का आसान तरीका है आपकी कम्प्लेन सुलझाने का और वो भी फ्री आर बी आई कहता है जानकार बनिए सतर्क रही Hello and welcome to the latest edition of our weekly show airing every Thursday, India Ideas, which is all about science and tech, innovation and entrepreneurship. I'm Gautam Roy. Today we're talking about the country's food and agri-tech startup sector because it has had a stellar performance during the last fiscal, making India the number one country in Asia-Pacific where investments or funding among startups in this category is concerned. Higher than even China. We're talking today with representatives of Omniwo, which is a VC firm funding food and agri-tech startups in the country, and two of the agri-tech startups it has funded, that's Arya.ag and Resha Mandi, to find out how the sector has achieved this feat and what does the future hold for it. Now, investments in technology startups in the agriculture and food sector in the country jumped over twofold to $4.6 billion during the last fiscal on the back of higher inflow in restaurant marketplace and e grocery. That's what a report brought out by AgFunder and Omniwar says. Food agri tech funding was up 